Okay, hello students, it's Professor Bell here with you to look at your last chapter of the textbook in semester about urban geography. So we're going to be looking at cities and the aspects associated with the urban milieu. So uh, if we take a look to begin with as the opening uh, page of your chapter shows uh, some pictures from Melbourne and it's going to be fairly similar wherever you go in terms of the the disparity between haves and have-nots in any given city. Now, you have less so in more developed cities, uh, obviously, of, of, of the West, of, say, you know, of North America, Europe, Japan, and, and Australia, New Zealand, um, than you'd see in other places. But homelessness and, um, you know, sometimes tent cities, uh, people coming uh, to the city looking for opportunities, access to money, access for opportunities and whatnot is going to always be a thing. Uh, you you may just not see as much of it in a place like a Melbourne, uh, which has plenty of green space, nice, you know, pond or pools to go to, biking, uh, very open, uh, softscaping as well uh, when you see the green with the metal buildings, metal and glass in the background. Um, but uh, none of these are true utopias. And so looking at some of the issues associated with cities is going to be part of the issue as well. Okay. So um, if you're, if, if you haven't paid attention, uh, maybe a ninth, when was it? I'm trying to think now, ninth, uh, 2000, maybe in six or seven. I can't remember exactly when it was that uh, it was determined that we as a species became less rural and more urban at that time. 50, you know, we crossed that 50% threshold. Um, so this graph, I'm trying to remember from when I first read about it, but this graph is showing you somewhere around, if I can find my cursor here, the 50% mark uh, was somewhere right around uh, 2010, something like that, um, as, as percent you know, urban overall, and then the totaling of, of the urban population uh, in, in billions uh, by, what is it, 2020, 4.2 billion. So obviously more than half of the population is there and clearly it's going to grow. So with it comes uh, its opportunities, but also its problems. And so having that many people, uh, you know, in a certain area is going to be is going to pose its own challenges. So uh, when we look at population uh, as a percent, uh, we certainly see it high in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, big countries, you know, Canada, United States, Brazil, three of the top five largest countries in the world. Um, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Venezuela, all, all are 80% or above. Um, but once we start looking into places like Africa, these, these countries here, if you don't know, are uh, Niger right here, South Sudan, Uganda, the Ethiopia, and Eritrea. Eritrea actually has no data. Uh, this is Nepal right here. So all of these are, are quite low. Uh, this is uh, Papua New Guinea, for instance. And then uh, when, when you look at uh, the countries in orange, like a Chad or a Sudan, Afghanistan or Pakistan or India or Bangladesh or Myanmar or Laos or Vietnam. These te this tells you there's this is agrarian societies, lots of people living in the countryside. Uh, you'd also see it's not very well developed economies uh, since so many people would be living in those areas, not out of choice, but out of necessity to be farming. And that's how they make their livelihood. Uh, but then you get countries in transition like uh, like China, uh, like Egypt, you know, uh, so it just depends. Uh, this, this is, uh, something too, if you look at Russia, a lot of the things these maps don't show, these thematic maps is they don't show is where all the people actually are. So yes, they're in the urban areas, but, um, we've talked a little bit over the semester about Siberia. Okay. So very few people are out in this area. Most of the people if you track down from Novaya Zemlya right down through here, this is the Ural Mountains. So more than 80% of the people of Russia live right here. Uh, same thing with China. Very few people are over here in the West. 
Okay, very few. Most of that 1.3 billion live right in this area right here. But that they're going to cities too is profound. So let's see how this works. Um, when we look at the world's largest cities, some may shock you. I don't even know if you've heard of some of these. Uh, but certainly you've heard of a lot of them from Tokyo, uh, what, Moscow, Paris, New York, Mexico City, L.A., Rio you've heard of. But I don't know if you've heard of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is one of the more populous cities in the entire world. And what I mean is it's way up in the top ten. Uh, it's bigger than Rio and Buenos Aires, uh, both. Uh, and that you have uh, growing numbers of cities in developing world regions like Lagos and Nigeria, Kinshasa, the capital of Democratic Republic of Congo. Jakarta, this is one I need to put on your list here uh, simply because uh, it's not going, it's a big city, but it's it may not hold its status. Uh, this country has already decided that they're going to move their capital city to the neighboring island of Borneo uh, because it's, it's overcrowded, it's uh, prone to pollution, uh, under peril of sea level rise and has any number of myriad problems going on in it. So they're actually going to move that capital city, which will have a hit on how many people live there. Uh, the growth of these uh, these southern cities like Guangzhou and Shenzhen and China uh, is this shift of people from the interior, though, moving to coastal cities for manufacturing jobs. But the growth of other uh, cities that haven't made this map, like a Lima, Bogota, Santiago, Luanda, and uh, Dar es Salaam, among others, may make that leap and go to over 10 million inhabitants. Again, they're making it a mega city. Okay. Um, if we look at what was the best city in the world, uh, which would have been also one of the biggest, um, it would have been you know Baghdad back a thousand years ago, and uh, this was this was a highly developed city of of uh, scientists, uh, certainly religious leaders and other leaders, but mathematicians, scholars, astronomers. Uh, one of the libraries that would have probably rivaled that of Alexandria that we know, of course, burned in Egypt. Well, this one was sacked by... Um, by the Mongol invaders, the Mongol horde here, uh, grandson of uh, Chinggis Khan, uh, Hulagu Khan, went through here and just tore this place to pieces, and it never really recovered. Uh, and so you can see cities could fall into peril. Uh, and I'll give you an example of this. This was the city that was sacked, that was Baghdad. But, you know, Tokyo, as well developed as it is, had what was called a 70-year rule, which meant an earthquake will occur about every 70 years and destroy the city. And the last one that happened was, uh, uh, the most devastating was in 1930 and killed about half the population, I think it was. That Maybe I'm overstating that, but it really, uh, it raised most of the houses which used braziers, so the the fire, the conflagration took out a bunch of people. You also had a tsunami associated with it. But now consider how big that city is, over 30 million people, how dominant it is in the world economic scheme of things, top tier world city, uh, which we'll see in just a moment. Um, but what impact that would have when the next big earthquake hits. It's going to have global repercussions because of the global economy. And uh, it's going to, I don't, I'm not saying they won't build it back, but possibilities there. So where did really cities begin? Well, we're not totally certain and, and not all people, uh, archaeologists and others agree that, that uh, I don't even know how to pronounce I know Jericho. I got that one from the Bible. But in Turkey, Katalohuk, Katalohuk. Um, in modern Turkey are considered uh, some of the earliest cities. Uh, but here's one thing you should know is that this city right here, Ur, uh, which was part of Sumer, uh, this, this is the term, the city that's used to talk about anything that's kind of the first to begin, the Ur language or the whatever it is just if you ever see that in your reading the or something or other that's what they mean is it's the it's the very beginning um but it depends on how you you want to look at these cities about how, how do you define city how big is it is there is there governance is there social stratification is there standing army or is there this or is there that um it that or the the professional debates among those individuals that are involved, but certainly farming uh, was the key to this and, and making sure you have secure food stuff back from chapter eight um, to make sure you have, well, one, you have to be settled down to be doing this, right? 
to be citified, you've got to settle down, and settling down in, includes tilling the soil and tending the cattle and the sheep and whatever your animals are. So obviously we move as a species from being hunter-gatherers and endlessly mobile to now sedentary farmers and herders. So uh, you may transition your you know, you you may you may take your your flocks, your herds uh, to different grazing grounds called transhumance at some point, but you're still basically in the same area, so settling down. And so archaeology provides a lot of information based on this and trying to understand how families how we move from kin and clans into uh, non blood based societies and making cities work with all these different people that you're not related to was kind of in its own, you know, uh I won't say a miracle, but certainly with languages, religions, social stratification that came along with it like soldiers and rulers and farmers and these things these these were ways in which culture adapted to moving into cities. Uh, so your six urban hearths here, certainly Mesoamerica, the Andean region, focused uh, mainly around uh, Cusco in Peru, uh, the Nile, the lower Nile, I should say, which is in Egypt, uh, Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers between the Tigris and Euphrates, where you'd find Baghdad today, uh, the Indus River Valley that's often referred to as the Harappa civilization or uh, maybe mentioned uh, a city like uh, Mahenjadaro. Uh, and the Huang He, uh, the yellow, this is the Yellow River, and it's, they call it yellow because it's full of sediment, but um, this is at the confluence of the Yellow and the Hui Rivers, uh, where you'd start to see early societies, and eventually what would evolve from these would be many different uh, dynasties or groups, you know, depending on you know, the time frame. And, but this is kind of a narrow look too. So as your textbook points out, there were probably other hearth areas as well. So I picked one here in Ghana. Um, that would have been the Ghana, Mali, and Songhai uh, area. And just to give you some of the traditional housing that you see there of a compound from Ghana in West Africa. Uh, that's going to be this area right in here. Sorry. This is Ghana. This is Mali, and in this area, this is this is where these these civilizations did develop. Okay, okay. I wanted to show you uh, hydro hydraulic civilization theory. Uh, this of uh, 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 of the idea that if once you're controlling water, then such so, such civilizations can be born, and so irrigation or cisterns, trapping of water underneath, or as you see here, this is a uh, step well called a bauri. Uh, uh, the Chan Bayori is in is is near um, Jaipur in western India, which is largely a desert state, and so um, they built this quite elaborate uh, way in which of having water all throughout the year that you could come and get wash you know washing or or you know wash clothes or to use for your your home uh, cleaning, cooking, drinking, all of those kinds of things. So controlling water was a big part of uh, Whitfogel's ideas behind culture and, and agriculture coming along uh, for, again, uh, managing water as to then being able to settle around the area, not having to, for instance, always wait on the river to bring it to you or for the rain to fall out of the sky to bring it to you. No, this is, this is engineering, if you will. Okay. So uh, when we see urban hearth areas, they'd go from ziggurats like here in Mesopotamia uh, to uh, the pagodas and shrines. Uh, and this is the forbidden city that you'd see in uh, Beijing and China. Uh, or this uh, El uh, Kukulcan, uh, this, or as the Spanish called it, El Castillo. This in Maya, uh, Mayan uh, Yucatan Peninsula. So these, these structures really stand out about areas and, and how you could organize people around celestial events. This is a big calendar, if you don't know. Uh, this city, or and this design of the Forbidden City is based on uh, cosmomagical properties we'll talk about. So I'm actually going to have to cut this off uh, real quickly. I'm sorry, I couldn't see my timer. So I'm going to come back to this slide in part two of this lecture. So I'll see you in just a minute.